Okay, we are good to go. Okay, so uh, welcome guys once again, and thank you for joining us. And welcome also guys who are watching us on uh, YouTube live streaming. Uh, very special session today. We have uh, a very special man with us, uh, Philip Medicus, popularly known as Pipo. And Pipo started his flying career, I think, really, really young when he was making paper planes. Uh, so started with paper planes and uh, uh, then moved on to, you know, flying uh, RC planes. I think flying fascinated him. I think flying fascinates all children. Uh, if, if it doesn't fascinate, then I think that something is not right with you. So, so uh, moved on to sailplanes. <clears throat> How lucky to, uh, as a teenager, he started flying sailplanes in Austria. And uh, a few years after, he discovered paragliding. And his first wing as well happened to be a Nova wing. And uh, I hope everyone saw the painting I shared. Uh, which he drew as a 12-year-old uh, in the uh, Facebook uh, trivia. So I think what fascinated him in the beginning itself was uh, hike and fly. Uh, the, the wings used to be really heavy, 15, 20 kilos, uh, you know, at that time, but he was still climbing mountains and, you know, flying uh, from mountains. And... Uh, after graduating, you know, from school, he went on to study mechanical engineering. And uh, as he was flying, you know, NOAA wings, he exchanged some emails with them. Little did he realize that, you know, they were right near Innsbruck. And uh, then some association uh, went on and he started to, you know, meet them and started doing, you know, small jobs in the beginning. Uh, like looking after their website and, you know, taking pictures for them uh, and stuff like that. And from there, the association grew and he's been fascinated with science aspect and the technological aspect of flying as well, along with flying and kind of things organically developed. And today he's uh, the head of research and development for NOAA. And uh, that's why he's here. And uh, what can be better, you know, it's a blessing that you enjoy what you're doing or you do what you enjoy. And in this case, I think it's, it's working both ways. And I'm looking forward to hearing from people, you know, the, the journey a little bit and also the whole life cycle of how a parallel is born and uh, all the processes, considerations, aspects. And uh, then we'll have, you know, uh, the house open for interesting you know questions from uh, the people behind the wings that we fly so over to you people and enjoy yourself and welcome from everyone thank you very much for the introduction i am going to start with my presentation and start the screen sharing So, do you see my screen? Yes. OK, perfect. Yeah, so I'm going um, to start my presentation with how a paraglider is designed. Uh, I'm going to go through the very first step, basically starting uh, from a blank white sheet, where you uh that's actually how the that, that's really how the design or at least at nova how the design of a paraglider start you have to start really simple and the simplest part of the paraglider is kind of oneself so we usually the very first step i think about usually is the number of cells and very much related to the number of cells is the line layout and again, very much related to the line layout and the number of cells, uh, the diagonals inside the wing. 
that's usually how a how a very first sketch of a paraglider looks like. It does not even have a curvature. It just shows those very basic first parameters. Obviously, you don't want to have too many lines because the, you want to avoid the line drag. On the other hand, you might not want to have too many diagonals inside the wing because they add weight. So you can spend quite some time into this simple drawing until I think it makes sense to go from there until I have the feeling this very basic setup makes sense. Uh, now, probably everybody can identify a paraglider because the curvature is added to this still very simple sketch. Uh, then what is missing is the view from above, which is the platform. The wing I was showing before is an ion six and the platform of that wing is around 5.2, actually a little bit less. Then uh, last but not least, every paraglider needs an airfoil. Uh, paragliding airfoils are quite different than the airfoils which actually all other aircraft use. The reason for that is that the uh, on the paraglider, the airfoil should not just make lift and very little drag. It's also, it also has a structural purpose. That means the airfoil must prevent deformations. The airfoil has to react in a certain way when the wing collapses. And this is not uh, relevant for any other wing, any other aircraft actually. So we can't, we can't just simply take some of the thousands existing airfoils because that wouldn't work on a paraglider. So we have to do our, the research ourselves. Obviously, uh, one way to do that research are simulations. I will talk about it later. When we design an airfoil, we do a lot of CFD simulations. That's what you see here. I will talk about that later more extensively. And the second, just as important is the experience we have because we know how certain airfoils react, for example, in terms of collapse behavior. That's something you can't simulate yet, at least. And therefore, yeah, the experience plays an important role. Now with the airfoil and with the lines and the platform, you actually have a paraglider. And the last design parameter I am going to talk about is the ballooning. This ballooning on the screen is very exaggerated, but this is basically what would happen if there was just the internal pressure. The wing would inflate like an air mattress. And that's basically what happens on the paraglider. The internal pressure is higher than the external pressure and therefore the ballooning is generated. The difference to the air mattress uh, is the curvature and the wing tips, which are creating a spanwise force and they basically stretch the paraglider and therefore reduce the ballooning until it looks to what you're used to. Um, if you have a deeper look into the ballooning, it's not only this spanwise tension. So you, I, I'm showing this spanwise tension here again. But if you look more into detail, you will see that there are line forces and forces of the diagonals pulling. Um, so the, the, the situation of these forces is really different from cell to cell. And it's 
maybe the most complex and one of the most complex parts of paraglider design, but it's something which is often, often overlooked. But I'll share another view of the ballooning. If you look at the 3D paraglider here, you will notice that the leading edge is quite smooth. You don't see a lot of ballooning there. If you go further back, you see a lot of ballooning and it again decreases a little bit at the trailing edge. The reason for that is what you see here at the right hand side is this top sail panel. It's the actual uh, shape of this top sail panel. And you see here, it's exaggerated to make it more visible. You see that it's quite narrow here in front. That's the very front part. It gets a bit wider in the middle and it gets again not more narrow at the rear. And yeah, this the, the, the reason for this shape is that we want a, a clean shape at the leading edge. We also want a lot of tension at the leading edge. A similar thing is valid for the trailing edge. Yeah, and a lot of a lot of know-how and a lot of experience goes into this. That's yeah, that's why I had three slides prepared for the ballooning. Then we have more or less all parameters ready to have a real 3D paraglider model that looks quite close to the final paraglider. Here is a look at all the internal parts. Uh, you see the ribs, the diagonal ribs, you see in vector straps. And at this stage of the design process, the maybe most fun parts besides flying starts, that's the simulation. Um, we do two types of simulation. The first type is the fluid simulation, computational fluid dynamics is this, is, is the name for it. That's basically a virtual wind tunnel. So we put a paraglider in this virtual wind tunnel and the software computes how the airflow um, flows around this object. So what you see here in different colors are different turbulence grades. You see this wingtip vortex. That looks quite fancy. Uh, and this simulation also covers, sorry, this simulation also covers the inside of the wing. What you actually see here is some air flowing outside of the openings because they weren't designed very well in this virtual prototype. A less fancy picture is just this 2D view of a uh, of an airfoil and the opening. So what you see here is this so-called stagnation point with the very high pressure. And from there to the top and to the bottom, the pressure decreases. You see the internal pressure. We use those rather those simple kinds of simulation um, to play with different airfoils, to play with different openings. But all the another besides the airflow speciality of the paraglider, another another thing where the paraglider is quite unique is that it deforms so much. So the what happens is the uh, aerodynamic forces lead to deformations of the paraglider. And those deformations, again, lead to a change of aerodynamic forces. And to cover that, uh, you have to introduce a different kind of simulation, uh, structural simulation. 
because that wind tunnel type of simulation I showed you before um, does not allow any kind of deformation. That's basically a paraglider made out of stone in this virtual wind tunnel, but that's obviously not what is happening in reality. And that's why we also work with this structural simulation. Yeah, what and this simulation helps us to predict wrinkles. Sorry, the wrinkle you saw here on the actual glider on the right and in the simulation on the left. That's another view where you, if you closely look, you see small deformations on the leading edge. We can even introduce those small nylon rods in this simulation to try to really get rid of all wrinkles or small deformations, at least if they uh, harm the performance. Yeah, that's what you see here. And that's quite, yeah, that, that's quite fascinating and interesting to be able to work with that and to be able to uh, progress so much in the design process before starting to actually build a very first glider. Then, uh, and another advantage of the simulation is obviously that it works quite fast and that you can simulate yeah, hundreds of different designs, which would be impossible to actually build and test. So we, in, because of those, or thanks to those simulations, we know quite a bit about the first prototype before even building it. What you see here are all the patterns of an ion. Actually, it's only half the glider because the production just needs half of the wing because it happens to be summit symmetric. But I will jump back a little bit what we have to decide before building the actual pr prototype is the choice of materials. Uh, the most important materials is the cloth and the lines, so I will only cover those two. Um, what you see here is the a sheeting process of a line. So the, the, the red fiber is the is used to sheet the the name of fiber inside, and on top you see the final line. We obviously want a paragliding line to have a high strength and a low diameter because the line drag is quite has, is, has a, a, quite a big fraction of the overall drag. So we try to have the lines as thin as possible. Um, we don't just want them to be strong when they are new, but we also want them to be strong after a certain amount of aging. And we want the line length to stay stable because we don't want the paraglider to change its trim. There is no line material which perfectly fulfills all those three demands. Um, the two line materials we have is Dyneema and Kevlar. The advantage of the Dyneema lines, the Dyneema lines are the ones with this, with, with the, um, very with the almost white core, they offer very high stability and don't lose almost any strength, but they tend to shrink if there is little load. The Kevlar lines shrink less, but lose a lot more strength when aging. Um, I, I'll talk in uh, one of the next slides, how we actually decide which material to take. 
then the choice of the line material of, of the cloth material we have um, yeah a, a similar amount of different materials to choose we obviously want the cloth to be very light we want a low level of porosity even after the wing is aged we want obviously sufficient strength we want a high dimensional stability by this i mean that the cloth um, does not deform it should not it should not shrink in any direction and the last issue is quite important but probably not very well known we want a high level of flatness um, that means we want the cloth when it's laying on the laser cutter before cutting to be really flat like a piece of paper without any wrinkles there are some cloth which are better and some which are worse in that regard if you don't have a very flat cloth uh, that will lead to mistakes in the cutting process um, all the cloth we currently use have a nylon nylon ripstop fiber with different diameters but there are quite different coatings available the coating affects the porosity and the stiffness so there is a special coating for the parts of the paraglider we which are inside which are the ribs and the diagonal ribs mainly that cloth is a lot stiffer and the cloth we use on the top and bottom sail, yeah, is softer. Then I will talk about how we finally choose the right material that refers to the lines and to the cloth. What we do a lot is evalu evaluate our check data. Uh, our checks, the checks which are performed by authorized Nova dealers, they are all stored on a central server. So we have the check data of many thousand checks. That means, uh, yeah, we can evaluate many, the, the checks of many thousand wings and look at them in average. For example, we, what you see on the top left, is how the line length change. And if you uh, look at 1000 ions in average, for example, you get a very good idea how different line materials tend to behave over time. And this data is extremely, extremely helpful to find out which line materials work better and which work worse. Uh, similarly, uh, quite the same is valid for the cloth. What you see here, every checker has to measure the porosity of the cloth on five different parts of the glider. Yeah, same here, we have all this check data. Same for the ripping strength of the lines. The lines are ripped and we have 100, so even many thousand ripped lines of a certain line type. And we have a software to evaluate all those checks. And yeah, we do that quite re regularly because that's a really valuable database for us. Then besides that, we do some lab tests. The first one that it, it sounds a bit strange, but it's um, quite common in textile testing, it's a washing test. What you do is you use a standard washing machine, put some cloth in there, wash it uh, without any, uh, without any uh, washing liquid or anything, and then evaluate porosity, ripping strength. And the funny thing is that this aging inside the washing machine relates quite well to the aging of a paraglider in flight. At least 
relatively. So if you have two different cloth types, you put them into that washing machine together and uh, one uh, age is worse than the other, it's very, very likely that the very same is going to happen in real life. That's why we use this washing test quite a lot. And we do UV exposure tests. Um, um, we do both tests, never for one single cloth, but always, uh, always a bunch of different cloth to be able to compare them. Yeah. And in the end, here you see the results of three different cloth after this washing test. We measure after each washing cycle, we measure the porosity and uh, you find out that those two cloth on the bottom behave a lot better than the one on the top. Uh, yeah, that's what our material, material decisions is based on, on those two things. Then, finally, the production of the prototype. What you see here is the laser cutter. You see the this white cloth laying on the table. And right before the laser cutter starts its work. Maybe you can here refer to the flatness I was talking about. If you imagine a worse cloth which shows wrinkle when laying on this cutter that necessarily leads to unintended shapes. Here you see the sewing process. You see it's quite many parts involved and it's the, some, some parts of sewing a paraglider are quite tricky and need quite some experience. It's really difficult to be precise on the one hand and uh, not mess up the parts and know what you're doing. What you see here is a quality check halfway through production. The three guys here are checking uh, if all parts are properly sewn together before finally connecting top and bottom of the wing. That's how the prototype is created. Then when we finally get the first prototype, we often start with performance comparisons. That's one of the, yeah, one of the things we are most interested in, how the wing performs. We usually do that with two wings, not with three, like shown in this picture. So what we basically do is two pilots with uh, the same wing loading, the same harness, fly side to side in calm air. Then we swap pilots to and do the same again, because uh, sometimes even a thick check hit of one pilot can affect the performance and by switching pilots, we make sure that the results are really reliable. Then we do maneuver tests. I have to switch here because that didn't work. Sorry. This video here shows the three shows the three most important maneuvers. That's the side collapse. Then you see the front collapse. And the parachuter stall. Here we check if the wing is going to go back to normal flight by itself. Uh, 
Um, those were just uh, the th if I had to pick three the most the three most important maneuvers it would be those three the side collapse the frontal collapse and the return from parachutal stall so that's probably the three maneuvers we do we do the most overall I will talk about it later there are uh, around 30 maneuvers which we have to do for the certification but yeah there are three to five which are actually crucial then uh, last but not least we do handling tests those handling tests are almost all the time done in turbulent air because we want to find out how the wing react when thermaling when flying through turbulences um, the easiest way to change the handling to improve the handling is change the geometry of the brake you see here the these yellow brake lines it's quite easy to make some lines longer make some lines shorter even add some lines or remove some lines and there are infinite possibilities how to change the brake and therefore how to change the turning behavior of the glider then the the difficult thing is that the performance the safety and the handling very often interacts and very often not in the way we want so if we find a way to improve the performance it very often happens that the safety gets worse or otherwise if we find a way how to improve the safety sometimes the handling or very often the handling gets worse and it's uh, quite difficult uh, iteration process to finally be satisfied with the handling with the performance and with the safety of the glider but when this is done this can uh, take many prototypes uh that varies from wing to wing sometimes we are able to finish with three prototypes sometimes it's a lot more uh, what we then start is the certification the the first part of the certification process is the so-called shock and load test what you see here first is the shock test once again in slow motion a car with uh, almost 100 kilometers per hour suddenly pulls at this glider which is connected with a weak link to the car and it's a 1000 kilogram weak link and that must and the weak link has to rip without the paraglider being destroyed what you see here is the second part of the test a very heavy very strong quite fast truck accelerates until the load of the paraglider exceeds eight times the intended takeoff weight. So if we want the paraglider to be certified with 100 kilograms, uh, this truck drives fast enough to reach eight times those, eight until it, reach eight, it reaches 800 kilograms. Here's another view on this load test. In this case, the wing rip. Uh, and this, the, the last two videos I showed you, I showed you on this uh, on this truck. The, the load is measured. What you see here is decanewton, which is basically kilograms. Um, that was a lightweight glider, and it ripped at about 900 kilograms, which was quite exactly what we are aiming for. So the 
wing before, usually before the, the flight tests are carried out, the wing has to pass those with two tests. One is the shock test and the other one is the load test. Load test is usually the one which is a bit more difficult to pass. Then, sorry, I have to switch again, but, but for the last time, the flight test. It's actually similar to what I showed you before. That's side collapse again. Next one is the frontal collapse from an outside view. It's a quite a nice perspective, I think. Here I added a spiral dive. And like in the last video, the return of the glider from parachute stall to normal flight. Um, I picked four videos, uh, four maneuvers. Like I said before, there is a list of, of 30 maneuvers. Most of them are rather boring. One of the maneuvers is the takeoff behavior. The other maneuver is the landing behavior, um, the damping of the paraglider, the pitch damping, the roll damping is evaluated. Um, but the yeah the, the most critical maneuvers are the four i was talking about so it's the side collapse which can give you a lot of troubles the frontal collapse it's the spiral dive where the paraglider at least a and b and c gliders have to exit by themselves without any pilot's input and it's the return from parachutal stall um, Another note, obviously the test house for the certification, all those maneuvers are done with one wing with one certain trim. And what we do before we certify the glider is we try to find out, we do those tests with very, with many different trim setups. Because uh, like I said before, the lines, don't perfectly keep their length, they tend to shrink. So the paraglider might get a bit slower or a bit faster after some hours of flight. And during development, we make sure that the wing still stays safe. So we know from, uh, from the check data I was talking about before, we know how the worst 3% of all check gliders look like in terms of trim. So for, we know what to expect after 100 hours, after 100 uh, operation hours, how much the wing gets slower usually, for example. And then what we do on the, on the prototype, we deliberately make it slower by that amount. And then we check all those important maneuvers. So we try to, cover those worst case scenarios that can happen during the aging of a glider. The certification is obviously only done with one certain trim setup. Yeah, that's uh, the end of my presentation and the of the life cycle of a paraglider, which for me ends when the wing is certified. Are you muted? Okay, so we can open for some questions now? Sure. Great.
So I think Deepak, uh, you had a question. You want to uh, uh, clarify that, or you got your answer? Yeah, we can. Just, uh, I we can. Hear? Can you hear we me? Can... Yeah. Uh, people, can we remove the? Oh, certainly. I stopped the screen sharing. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Can you get to the slide where? Yeah, the slide where you showed. Um, the choice of material and you used the different parameters on the left and right wing. I saw that you have a different parameters for the left and right wing, but you said that uh, since we are symmetrical, we only simulate the left side, but the parameters for the right wing were different. That was my question. Uh, on this uh, on this slide where, yeah, the, oh, I, I, I haven't explained that properly. Uh, sorry, one moment. I, I will quickly um, show this slide again. So what you see, you are talking about, yeah, this, this is the right is, side. Yeah, this one is clear. But the next one where you showed on the choice of materials and yeah. where you say, yeah, this yeah. one, yes. So here we see the parameters of the left and right wing. Are yes. Different. Okay. That's just uh, I I I what I picked here is a measure a real measurement a real random one single measurement of just one single glider, uh -huh. which always happens to be asymmetric to a certain extent. But uh -huh. what we do in the end is uh, create the average of many hundreds, um, sometimes even thousands of gliders. And then there is no more asymmetry visible because oh. of the, that was just, that just shows the measurement of one single wing, which yeah, just happens to be asymmetric. Yeah, all right, I understand that now. And I have one more follow-up, not follow-up question, but I have another question there. In the last, when you said for the certification, the effect of aging. So do you fly the prototype for 100 hours and then you see the effect of aging or do you simulate it for 100 hours? We, um, the most important aspect of the aging is the change of line length. And mm -hmm. that's quite easy. And, and we, and, and from the evaluation of all the, uh, check results, we know quite precisely what to expect. And therefore, we actually simulate uh, what, what would happen during the aging by just changing the line length according, mm -hmm. according to this evaluation. So for example, if we know the sea lines tend to shrink by worst case two centimeters relatively mm -hmm. to the A and B lines. What we simply do on the prototype is uh, short sea lines by those two centimeters, fly the wing and evaluate the behavior. And that way we can go through, we, we can check different uh, setups in one flight each. Okay, so if I understand you correctly, that uh, I mean, since from simulation results, you know the effect of aging after 100 hours and those uh, things you put on the real glider and then fly it and see, okay, is it passed or not? Am I right? Yes, yes, more or okay. less, yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. Yes. Yeah. Sounds good, sounds good. Yeah, and that's, uh, those are all the questions I have. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks. Prashant, go ahead with your question. People, hi, my name is Prashant. Uh, I can't see people. Is the video on? Yeah, Prashant, just be louder. Okay, people, can you hear me now? Yes. Perfectly. Okay, great, brilliant. So I have three questions really now for you. Uh, number one, induced track plays a role and even profile track play a role. Now, induced track, like you very rightly said, probably reducing the number of lines and design shape of the profile, you can uh, reduce that. What do you do to reduce induced track? I have seen certain paraglider wings, they have a winglet, 
like for example a conventional aircraft it has winglets at the end to basically to reduce the vortex that's the induced drag so how does a paraglider wing achieve that um the there are two main uh, parameters which affect the induced drag one of them is the aspect ratio and the other of them is the lift distribution. So how the uh, lift is distributed uh, from the center of the wing to the wing tips. And the winglets, um, I think what winglets mainly do is uh, increase the aspect ratio without increasing the wingspan. So, not really, because the winglets are certain aircraft, though they reduce, they change the span wise loading of the wing, there's no doubt. But certain winglets, like take the 320, it doesn't effectively increase the span. It doesn't so, affect the span. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. That's, but in terms of induced drag, if you, the, yeah, the, the, the winglets, if they are uh, 90 degrees, if the winglets, if the winglets are vertical, they don't affect the wingspan, but they are, in terms they of are sort of rearranging the vortex at the wingtip yes, to reduce exactly. the induced drag. So exactly. how do you achieve that in your in your wing? Um, the I mean uh, to, to go back to go back to the planes for a moment. I think if if you look at very mm -hmm. modern planes, no matter if it's uh, sail planes or commercial planes you will see rather big winglets you, and you will see rather small to non-winglets at all. I think that shows that uh, winglets are not the only way. And I think uh, for, for, some, uh, for some airplanes, especially big commercial airplanes, as far as I know, the wingspan must not be too big because they have to fit through some aircraft infrastructure. And if the, if the wingspan is limited that way, it, uh, winglets make a lot of sense. Uh, the problem with winglets and paragliders is that I think it's very difficult to make them work. Because so basically, you mean it's a trade-off between the induced track, which you know will be there, and the technicality of manufacturing and implementing a winglet in a wing. You mean it's a trade-off somewhere? Yeah, you can uh, you can you can put it that way. Yeah, but I, I think I think even if uh, even if we were able to re to, to make winglets on a paraglider, I still think that there wouldn't be a very certain answer towards we need winglets because the same is valid for uh, for airplanes. You, you will see some with, I'm not super familiar with the modern airliner aircraft, but I think Boeing uses significantly bigger air uh, winglets than Airbus no. does, for example. Yeah, that's a different technology altogether. A little background, I'm an airline pilot, so uh -huh. I'm a test pilot, so I understand that. Uh -huh. The winglet, of, what you're talking about is a 737 MAX. The yeah, 737 it's... MAX has a very different winglet. Mm -hmm. However, if you see modern sailplanes also, which you have flown, I mean, I have flown a bit, they mm -hmm. also, the high performance aircrafts at least, they do yes. have winglets. So I would yeah. think that probably a competition gliders, yeah, paragliders, mm -hmm. which are performance, very high mm -hmm. performance machine. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't call them machines, but uh, wings that fly. Mm -hmm. I'm just thinking out loud. Would it have made a difference to have winglets to reduce induced track to give them that additional performance enhancement? I'm just thinking out loud. Um, again, the, 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 the main advantage of winglet on uh, sailplanes, as far as I know, is uh, actually not the performance in straight flight at a given speed, but it's more that the winglets help a lot for, for thermaling when one, with those very big, with this very high wingspan, the wing which is on the inner side 
of the circle is a lot slower than the one on the outside with a quite different angle of attack. And the winglets on sailplanes, they actually improve the handling of the wings quite a bit and not so much the raw glide performance that would be without knowing, without being an expert at this at all, this would be the explanation for me why modern um, airliners, where performance is just as important as for a sailplane or paraglider, because performance on an airliner means fuel consumption in the end. Correct, exactly. Um, and still, you see uh, modern Airbuses, for example, which I think have zero to almost zero winglets that for me shows that if you are going for maximum performance you don't need winglets okay now the second just, question for you yeah. sorry sorry great i'm sorry okay yeah and uh, so, so that's that would be the very general paragliding unspecific answer and the more paragliding specific answer but uh, i kind of talked about it already is that I think it's very difficult. You need yes. you need some rigidity of the winglet. If the winglet is That's just, right. if there is no rigidity, uh, it can uh, it it won't uh, lead the airflow into a certain direction. And I think that's very difficult to make on a paraglider. Because I guess your wing also, when you're inflating it, the cells they are also getting a certain amount of rigidity by the inflating by the pressure inside. Yes. So I guess since you have holes in your ribs to distribute the pressure equally span wise, so mm -hmm. probably you could just flow the pressure out in the winglet. In so I'm just thinking out loud. So you know best. Mm -hmm. It okay. it it would it would well, yeah it sure sure it's I mean it's uh, it you you can obviously build something that looks somehow like a wing, winglet on a paraglider. But I think it would be, or I'm quite certain that it's more difficult to make a winglet properly work on a paraglider than on a sailplane or on a Boeing on whatever, where you just put this rigid part wherever you want it and it keeps the intended shape. Okay. Okay, yeah. just two more questions. They're small ones. One, both, we have two lines, like you very rightly said, Dyneema and Aramid or Kevlar, whatever you call them. Both of them have very different characteristics, quite different. So when we know one type of line suits a requirement, why have the other line at all? Other type of line at all, material-wise? Um, I mean, what we, what we do on most of our wings, actually, is use both materials because the big... Uh, the, the big advantage of the Dyneema line is its super high strength for a given diameter, even, uh, even if it's old. So using Dyneema allows you to have less diameter and therefore less drag than using Kevlar. And um, that's why we on all, actually almost all our gliders on most parts of the A and the B lines, we use Dyneema. And again, on most of our gliders on the C lines and often also on the brake lines, where there is quite little load, we use Kevlar lines because the, the, the strength is not so crucial. So if we have a Kevlar line that easily loses 50% of its strength during, let's say, 100, 200 flights, that's whatever. Nice. Correct. Um, we, that's no problem on the C lines, but on the A and B, we would simply have to compensate that by making it a lot thicker. Then, okay. because we know it's going to lose like 50% of its strength, and so we, we have we have to make the on the new wing we have to make the line kind of twice as strong as it would actually have to be, and we try to avoid that and use 
for, to reduce the line drag, finally used anima lines. And with the, uh, with, by evaluating the check results I was talking about before, we knew that this mix we are using works quite well in terms of length stability. All right. Last question. You simulate fluid dynamics of your wing before you actually make it, like you just showed us now. After that, you do the flight test also, the final thing later on. How, act, how do I put it? How real are the results to the simulation models of your flight test as to what you've run into your simulation patterns? Um, so it depends on what we are looking for. The, the simulation gives quite accurate results in terms of glide performance. I mean, I have to say, uh, all the simulations we currently do only cover stationary straight flights, flight, no matter, okay. the, no matter if it's accelerated stationary state uh, straight flight or at trim speed stationary straight flight. But we, yeah, we, we don't simulate uh, things like things like collapses at all, or even yes. the wing turning. So there can't be any correspondence there. And so the stuff we are simulating, the performance and also the wrinkles and the deformation in straight flight, there is a, that corresponds very well. Okay. That All doesn't right. mean that there are still surprises from time to time, but then we usually yeah, find the reasons for them. So the performance in simulation corresponds very well to the performance in real life. Real time. Okay, yeah. I'm good people. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you, you're welcome. Uh, next is Saad. Saad, go ahead. Okay, hi. Uh, so just wanted to clarify between the difference between uh, ballooning and the airfoil because I understand every cell is basically an airfoil shape. So mm -hmm. how is, uh, what is the difference in the ballooning part? Um, I am, your question was how the ballooning changes the airfoil. Is that correct? I'm not sure if I no, understand. Uh, be loud a little bit. Your voice is not. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, just asking like, uh, how is ballooning different from the airfoil? Um, I mean, the, what we the, what we call ballooning is basically um, the, the height of those bows on the paraglider. So we, the, the, if, if there's zero ballooning, the airfoil in between the ribs in the center of the cell is, would be equal to the airfoil on the ribs. Uh, and the more ballooning we add, basically the thicker the airfoil in the center of the cell gets. But I'm still not 100% sure if I covered your question. Okay, I, I think I can help. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, Saad, the ballooning is an effect uh, which is caused because we are using a a material, a cloth material, yeah. because mm -hmm. we don't have a metallic aerofoil. So it's yeah. not the same aerofoil throughout the wing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, ballooning is just an effect because we are using a... Uh, yeah, uh, there's no uh, way to avoid it. A flexible... Okay. Yeah. Sad, you got the answer? Yeah, yeah. And uh, just to uh, know, are you going to explain some of the technologies later on? Like some of the technologies that have come in paragliding uh, you, design? You, you can ask Sad if uh, you have something in mind. If you want him to talk about shark nose or you know whatever you okay. have in mind, just one I wanted to clarify. One is in Noah called Spree Speed Break Riser. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure what is that. Um, that is the the Speed Break Riser is um, the idea behind it is to basically inverse what's happening when you use the speed system. So when you 
when you use the speed system, you shorten the A risers a lot and you shorten the B risers a little bit less to quite linearly um, reduce the angle of attack. Um, if you have a riser without this speed break riser system, if you pull the C riser, the B risers are not affected. That means uh, pulling the C risers usually causes a kink on the airfoil and the airfoil is deformed in an unintended way. And the speed break riser, if you, uh, if you pull the C on the speed break riser, the B is shortened as well. So that means the angle of attack is smoothly increased the same it is decreased when you push the speed bar. Oh, okay. Awesome. Thanks. Okay. Next is Avinash. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, a very good afternoon, uh, uh, Filippo. Um, um, I mean, uh, I was thrilled to hear that you are an Austrian, first of all, because I spent uh, four years of my life in Austria. That is uh, Uno City and at Cybersdorf. Uh, Indiana. Yes, I, yeah. I used to stay. And I used to stay near Kaisermullen and uh, used to go to for a swim in Altedano. <laughs> so, yeah, it was, yeah, uh, so um, it was uh, pleasant uh, hearing about you. Um, uh, my question would be, um, uh, uh, my first glider is uh, uh, Advanced Alpha 5 and uh, it has a couple of fins at the tips of the wing. So, uh, what are they exactly called and, uh, you know, um, uh, is there a similar thing in NOAA or uh, how do they uh, improve the performance sort of? That was my question. Um, you, you were interrupted for a second. Uh, I, I didn't fully understand, understand. your question, unfortunately. Okay. Can you? Yeah, I'll repeat it. Um, uh, my first wing is uh, Advanced Alpha Phi. Mm -hmm. And it has, uh, on a wing tip, it has small fins at mm -hmm. the edge. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So in NOAA, I, I don't see any fins. Mm -hmm. um, uh, what is the advantage of having the, spin, uh, the uh, fins at the edge? Um, uh, does yeah. it improve performance? Or is there any plans to bring it in NOAA as well? Uh, that was... That's that question is quite related um, to the winglet yes, question, uh, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right I before, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I without directly talking about competitors too much, <laughs> I right. I would um, repeat that I don't think that those winglets can be implemented in a beneficial way on a paraglider. And if you look at these winglets on the paragliders, they, over the years, and especially on high performance models, they are really, really small, which is kind of a hint that they are not too beneficial. And I think there is also an aspect of corporate design there. And not just about and not just about performance optimization. Uh, thanks, Filippo. Uh, I think you answered my question very nicely. Yeah, Perfect. thanks. Yeah, you're welcome. Okay, Malha, you're next. Yeah, uh, can you guys hear me? Hi, people. Perfect. Hi. Uh, yeah, I had a question. So I'm staying in France currently near Grenoble, and I see that the hike and fly culture here is uh, it's huge, it's large. So I was going across uh, NOAA website, and I saw uh, the two new models, IBEX and uh, Double Skin. So they're the one of the lightest paragliders. So I was just wondering when you go through all this uh, testing, and they're classified as ENA. 
so when they undergo testing do, do they go uh, undergo the same kind of testing uh say load testing or something uh, does it affect uh, if the material is light uh, uh, does it go undergo the same kind of testing and uh, is classified as ena uh yeah the uh, the the testing in terms of uh, certification is absolutely the same so the the, uh, the one of the load test videos i shot was actually at the double skin Mm -hmm. So the the load requirements are absolutely the same. The testing we do is also the same. So okay. that there is no difference in terms of lightweight or non light wings. But obviously, uh, obviously, very light wings or very light uh, materials. If you treat them exactly the same as heavier materials they won't last as long so it's a bit easier to um damage a very light cloth than it is to damage a heavier cloth and usually it depends a bit from cloth to cloth but uh, usually a heavier cloth will um sustain more UV exposure than a very light cloth. So yeah, that's, that's certainly something you have to keep in mind. But if you were talking about the double skin, those wings are usually used. Yeah, I mean, they're usually used for hike and fly and not so many pilots do five to eight hour flights with those gliders. So very often UV exposure is simply not an issue because even after, even a, a high can fly pilot, which flies for five years quite regularly, uh, uh, won't have a critical amount of UV exposure on this very lightweight wing. Yeah, but but still, it's that the lighter the wing, the 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 less it is robust. And and one more follow up question. So, uh, in if you compare the prion and uh, the double skin in terms of uh, performance, uh, is there a noticeable difference? I am assuming it there will be, uh, but in terms of handling and uh, in terms of. Uh, um, say maneuvers mm -hmm. um actually the the performance of the double skin is a bit better than of the prion one reason for that is that the prion uses significantly thicker lines than the double skin um and the handling is also quite different. I mean, those those two wings are, besides besides being E and A, they are really really different. It's a, those are two completely different designs. Um, yeah, so they they are quite different in 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 every aspect. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. <clears throat> so uh, I had a question, uh, people, for you. Uh, I think you fly Bantam five, right? Five. Oh, Bantam. Uh, Bantam, yes, yeah. So uh, can hike and fly wings be used for like you know strong wind flying, or there are like specific designs just for you know strong wind flying? Let's say. Uh, you fly in like 35, 40 kilometers per hour, or these wings currently can be used for strong wind flying. I or think, I, I think the the main difference is actually the material. For a for a high can fly wing, it's obviously very beneficial to be super light, and for a soaring wing, it's 
usually not beneficial at all to use very light materials because yeah you don't care the small wings are light enough anyway and for soaring you would probably re prefer more robustness but besides the material besides the material i would not say that there is a big difference uh, the focus is a bit different on a, on a high can fly glider the takeoff behavior at zero wind is very important which is absolutely a non-issue for soaring but uh, it's uh, certainly no disadvantage for soaring yeah so i would say i would say uh, it's quite similar in terms of demands and yeah so i would say the and actually we we had uh, quite some requests for the bantam um, as a soaring as a soaring glider for higher wind speeds and we have uh, quite a few pilots use it for that purpose even if that was not the number one intention. Okay, does uh, NOAA uh, or any other company design specific wings for strong wind soaring, like 35, 40K? Um, I don't think so. I mean, those would be, I mean, usually mini wings, uh, so-called mini wings are used for strong wind soaring or even speed flying gliders are used for strong wind soaring but to my knowledge uh, no manufacturer has ever dedicated a glider to especially strong wind soaring because it's because it's so similar because of a, a good mini wing which is nice for hike and fly and descending mountains will also be good for strong wind soaring the main sorry. difference would be yeah the, we, we had some sorry uh, we, we had some requests if we would offer a bantam in heavier with heavier materials for this uh, strong wind soaring purpose because we have conditions here like you know it can be a, a new sport itself and I think in mm -hmm. many places, like, you know, coastal places, where winds absolutely. get strong. Ab absolutely. Absolutely, yeah. So, I mean... Yeah, uh, we we are, may... we... Go ahead. We please. are considering that. We, we, are, we are considering uh, making a heavier version of the Bantam for strong winds, sorry. Uh, you, you're happy with Bantam? Like, uh, uh, I mean, you've been flying it and you think it'll be really good if uh, we you make it in heavy material for strong wind flying? I I think so. I think so. Yes, because we have uh, me personally. I I mean I've flown it in stronger winds, but uh, not a lot of actual soaring. Um, but we've had uh, uh, our dealer. A dealer for, for Italy has been in Hawaii for many weeks with the, with the Bantam 12 flying it in strong winds. Uh, and uh, s some experience in Sweden, I think, with it. And uh, yeah, they, they were all really happy with it. So I think it I think it's quite similar. We it's the, the hike and fly wing is supposed to be quite easy to manage in strong wind turbulent conditions. That's something okay. which also benefits the strong wind soaring. And the Bantam performs quite well. That's also something which is beneficial for soaring. Yeah. So also like, you know, you would want to like, you know, do maneuvers, like with the smaller wing, you can do like, you know, loops easily and hook turns and also yes. So that yes. aspect, I think, also will need to, uh, because that will be the next thing. Like, uh, you, you. Yeah, but that's also something which should quite the 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 line length of the bantam is especially low, 
Okay. So we, we, yeah. we actually wanted it because the takeoff benefits from it, but it also makes those barrel rolls very easy because, yeah, because the line length are so low. So I think it, uh, I think it would fit very well. Great. So that's, that, that sounds good. We look forward to, you know, mm -hmm. uh, Bantam coming in uh, thicker material. Yeah. Uh, cool. ne next question is, uh, you know, I think Theo's uh, joined NOAA, which is an interesting development. And, uh, but uh, NOAA has been a XC uh, kind of a company focusing mm -hmm. on, you know, uh, more of XC and mm -hmm. not so much in acro. Mm -hmm. And now you have, you know, this guy, uh, the world champion, joining NOAA. So it'll be interesting to know from you, you know, like where you are, what are you thinking and where are you going, you know, in terms of designing acro wings? I mean, for now, for now, the only thing, uh, the, the only acro wing we are working with is this glider uh, Theo is working on, or we are working together with Theo. It's actually quite finished. But uh, it's the, the wing. The, the wing Theo is flying now would not sell very well because only very few pilots can fly it. The the Theo has his own. He has his own philosophy of uh, trimming an acro glider and how an acro glider should fly. I think that was also the reason why he was approaching us and why he wasn't just picking one of the many existing acro gliders because he wanted to have, yeah, he's very, his very own acro glider. And, the, and this wing turns out to be really demanding in certain maneuvers for a not world champion, but for a normal, acro very pilot. good acro pilot who can, uh, a very good acro pilot who can easily fly uh, almost all existing maneuvers will have difficulties with, with this wing. But therefore, it is very good for what Theo wants, it, it does this, it shoots very much. So it does this stall to infinite maneuvers yeah. very well. And so the, the focus on this glider, the development focus on this glider was really on what Theo wants. And there are just so few pilots who want something similar that we won't sell this glider and we haven't decided any that, that does not mean we will never sell an acro glider that just means we won't sell this glider and we are currently not working on a more accessible acro glider we want to yeah we, we are almost finished with with theos glider but if we want to really 100 percent finish it and then go from there. But it's, it has been very interesting so far. Okay, so I think uh, one more question and uh, it should be okay. I think, uh, what's the cue, Satch? Yeah, I think it would be a last question maybe. Uh, so first of all, people, great session. I really thoroughly enjoyed a lot of uh, information. Uh, my question is uh, about uh, if you if we read about uh, paragliding lines, Kevlar Dynama, there is more or less enough information to understand and compare the characteristics characteristics of the lines. But if you check uh, the paragliding cloth, which is used in the market, which is especially Skytex or Domen Do Domenico, there is no comparison. There is the the text is not available uh, enough. That's what what I have seen. So I just wanted to understand understand from you. So when you are designing a glider. Uh, what? How do you decide which? Uh, I mean, sure, I'm sure you have a history and you have a lot of uh, uh, data uh, which you use. But uh, can you shed a little bit light on uh, these two type of uh, uh, cloths? 
of Porsche and Domenico. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, there is no, there is no general answer to this question. I cannot. The, the, there is no valid general statement, so I could not say. Domenico offers more UV resistance than Porsche or whatever, because it differs so much from cloth to cloth. Um, we just talked about the Pantam. There we use this Tendi Domenico, which is obviously the lightest cloth. I mean, that's just, there's, there's no room for discussion there. And it also offers more UV resistance in porosity than the same, than the comparable cloth from Porsche. But therefore the Porsche 27 uh, is a bit stiffer, which makes it easier to manufacture. So it's, you really have to closely look at what you want. For the Bantam, we wanted the, uh, very, a very light material, very small packing size. And um, there, the Dominico Tende is superior. If packing size and weight wasn't so much an issue, if it was more about performance, we might have chosen the Porsche 27 because you can you can sew it. It's easier to sew it very clean. Um, and that's just one example. But in the end, in the end, you have to really closely look at the demands of the glider and then carefully choose. Um, because there are just so many materials and so many applications for the materials. The, uh, the rib material, for example, we prefer to use Porsche there because it's the, the dynam dimensional stability is a big, big, bigger. So the shrinking is also an issue for uh, shrinking is also an issue for cloth, not just for lines. Um, and according to our tests, uh, our tests are the reason we prefer for those ribs and diagonal ribs, the Porsche cloth. And so there's really for, for every part of the glider and for each glider, there is a cloth which makes more sense but there is no general there is no general answer to this the okay. general answer would be that we we try to split to a certain extent because we don't want to be fully dependent on just one supplier uh, yeah but besides that you have to really evaluate it cloth by cloth by cloth there are better and worse cloth from Dominico and from Porsche. That's yeah. Okay, okay. Thank you, people. Understood. You're welcome. All right. So uh, thanks a lot, uh, people. Uh, You're welcome. Thank yeah, you. Thanks for the invitation. Pleasure, and uh, we hope our partnership goes a long way. Yeah, and, me too. And uh, hope to fly with you sometime as well. See you. Yeah, in either Austria or India. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. All right. Have a lovely evening, and uh, you too. Thank you very much. Have a nice day.